Cynthia Kaufman is the director of the Vasconcellos Institute for Democracy in Action at De Anza College and is on the board of Human Agenda. She is the author of two books, Getting Past Capitalism, History, Vision, Hope, and Ideas for Action, Relevant Theory for Radical Change. Those are two books. So let's give a humanist house welcome to Cynthia Kaufman. All right, does the technology work? Wow, you guys are good. That's <laughs> so great. I've never used one of these. I feel like I'm giving a TED talk. Um, so I wanted to, to first off say that I do have both of my books here for sale for 20 bucks, which is what I get them for. So there's a little bucket there. And then also, I am always really happy to give the books away for free. So if you're interested in, in having an electronic version of either book, just uh, sign up here and I'll, I'll email it to you. Um, and I wanted, I had a nice little conversation with uh, with Arthur, uh, just as we were starting, and um, and it occurred to me that when I wrote this book on capitalism, I I actually kind of felt a little bit afraid. Like this, I started it. So it was about ten years ago that I started writing this book, and at that time, it was really not very normal to talk about capitalism. And there was this idea, and I would say that I uh, that what I what I came to think of it as was internalized McCarthyism. You know, it's like if you talk about capitalism, that means you're a communist, and that means you're likely to go to jail or lose your job, right? So even though I I didn't live through that. I have friends whose parents lived through that, and I've just been around and thought about that. And I sort of grew up politically in a period where you could sort of talk about just about everything but capitalism, unless you're pro-capitalist, and then you could talk about it. So anyhow, I just want to say that I think we're in a really different time. One of the things I told Arthur is that uh, I just read this, I think, the day before yesterday, that, uh, that you know, surveys now say that 50% of young people, so you're sort of 18 to 25 range, if you ask them what they think about capitalism, they'll, they'll say that they think it's a bad idea. So we're moving into a really, really different period. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do today, I want to try not to talk for too, too long, and then so we have lots of time for conversation. And so whoever is sort of moderating me, if you wouldn't mind, uh, five minutes, let's, let's say at about 11.30, just remind me, say it's 11.30, so I'll, I'll kind of start to speed up and bring it to a close. Um, Okay, so I want to start by talking a little bit about what I think is wrong with capitalism, just to sort of make that case for anybody who's not sort of with me on that, though that's not really what my book is mostly about. It, my book mostly starts from the assumption that you think that capitalism is a problem. Then I want to talk a little bit about how to challenge it, and that's actually what motivated me to write this book, was the idea that I knew lots of people who were against capitalism, but I also felt like it was like either revolution or nothing, and since we're not having a revolution tomorrow, therefore we're going to do nothing about it. And so to think in practical ways about how to challenge capitalism. Talk a little bit about what I think of as the, as the viable, already existing alternatives, and then just with a couple little comments about what's happening in this country right now. Okay, so number one, the critique of capitalism. So I sort of define capitalism, most people define capitalism as private ownership of the means of production, which means that people with resources can do what they want with the resources in society that are necessary for people to survive. John Locke was one of the intellectual founders of that capitalist way of understanding the world, and his philosophy starts with a way of thinking that says that we're most free when we can do what we want with our resources. And the role of government is to protect our individual sphere of freedom and my individual sphere of freedom is myself, my body, and also all the stuff that I own. That's what freedom means, is protecting that stuff. Um, that idea, by the way, I think is alive and well uh, in, in uh, libertarianism, which I think is a really dominant mode of thinking in this particular valley that we're in. Um, and it's really what's being pushed with billions of dollars of support by the Koch brothers. And so it has a certain resonance that's, that's, that's quite profound. Um, OK, so problems with capitalism. One is that it leads to um, domination of those with money over the political. So you can think of capitalism as an economic system where people with resources can do what they want. But if they can do what they want in all spheres, then they get to control the political sphere, which means that then, then we don't have freedom and democracy and things like that. Number two, um, that if you say that everybody's free to do what they want and, and choose what they want, then if I'm an employer who has a job and you're a person who has nothing but your ability to work, me as the employer has a lot more power than you as the employee. And so you, we're going to come into free contracts where I have, uh, have the ability to define the situation and you don't have the ability to define that situation. So there's an incredible inequality under capitalism that leads towards the exploitation of labor, that leads towards people being in 
situations like sweatshops where people have to work in under terrible circumstances. Um, it also means that unlike other societies where people sort of do what they want based on traditional relationships or kind of communal agreements or you know worker owned co-ops where people get to sort of be creative and express themselves in work, that work becomes alienated. That was one of Marx's main concepts was that, that in my working I don't get to express myself and be creative but rather I'm sort of a, I'm a machine for you. You tell me what to do for eight hours a day and I do those things. And so I don't have power over my labor process. And then the other concept from Marx in that is exploitation. The idea that in my labor I'm going to work for you and you're going to get to get the profits from that and I get just whatever wage I'm able to negotiate. Okay, that's some kind of classic Marxist critique of capitalism. And then there's some bigger things that have to do with um, uh, the way that capitalism ends up putting money and profit as, as the sort of core motivator of what happens in society. And it then becomes very difficult to deal with sort of collective decision making. And I think the, I would say the biggest sort of what, what capitalist economists call market failure, but one of the biggest failures of capitalism that we're dealing with right now is climate change. Because right now what we have in this country is a supposedly free market economy where people who think, and where a lot of people think that regulation is bad, and where a political system is dominated by, right now, the Republican Party, who has been really bought off by, I would say, the Koch brothers and people who believe that, well, they're, they're, they're fossil fuel people and they want to keep us on fossil fuel. And so we're not able to sort to to regulate and um, to regulate the fossil fuel industry and deal with the problem of climate change as severely as we could. Now in California we have amazing. I don't want to be a, a pessimist. I'm a climate change activist. I think pessimism is dangerous and toxic. In California we're doing unbelievably great things to change our economy to get us off of fo fossil fuels, except for the fracking piece that Jerry Brown is into. But anyhow, but besides that, generally we're doing a pretty good job in California. And generally I think that it's not very hard hard to imagine how to regulate our way out of, out of climate change, which is just about um, uh, incentives for, for uh, alternative forms of energy, better city planning, and, uh, and, and uh, regulations against fossil fuels. We're doing that in California. We're not doing that as well in the rest of the parts of the country. And I would say that capitalism makes that really hard, because capitalism goes with this idea of let the market decide what the market wants to, let the market decide, m make as many social decisions as as possible, and that's really dangerous. Okay, so that's why I think capitalism is a problem. Now, what I found is I was I was sort of a I got involved in social justice politics uh, when I was 20 in 1980, and I was against U.S. support for military dictatorships in Central America. I quickly started reading and started understanding that capitalism is a big part of the problem. But I just as quickly realized that if you talked about that, you were going to be considered an authoritarian. You were going to be considered somebody who believed in you know uh, the state to dominate over our lives, and you were you know and the only thing you could possibly do was have a revolution to overthrow it. I found that very unsatisfying. And so uh, I spent a long time actually reading, like, why is it that Marxists and anti-capitalists think that, you, that it's a system that has to be overthrown? And I actually went to a talk by a, a geographer uh, when I was in grad school. Her name is Julie Graham. She's since passed away. But um, she said, you know, feminists don't think of it that way. If you're a feminist, you say, here's all the things I think are wrong with patriarchy, and here's all the different ways I'm going to challenge it, right? That's, that's just what you do. Same with anti-racists. Why is it that anti-capitalists are the only sort of social justice people who think that there is a system that must be overthrown once and for all or not? And I started reading a lot about that, and I feel like I, I now understand pretty well, I would say, the systemic natures of capitalism. And what I would say is capitalism is a set of practices that have really negative consequences, and they need to be challenged in all kinds of different ways, and that lots of things we do in the here and now challenge capitalism. Um, so... Uh, let me just give you some examples of that. So one of the things that Julie Graham argues that was very powerful for me is that half more than half of the current economy in the United States is non-capitalist. So we have household labor, right? So things that, that you know, women have typically done in the home. That's a huge amount of what happens in our society. People taking care of each other's children, people taking care of elders, people trading, you know, making cookies for their friends, uh, making things for their friends. There's a whole bunch of our economy, in other words, the things we do to meet our needs that are not capitalist. The, and so that's one sector is, is kind of, you know, sort of barter and share trade 
paid um, care-based labor. Another big part of our economy is what I would call the state or socialism. So, and the, I know the right wing loves to, to remember they went after Obama and said that you know uh, national health care is socialism. Well, I actually kind of agree with that, and I think it's helpful to say that when we tax people and that goes to a state and the state distributes for social goods, that that actually is the definition of socialism. And I think a lot of what's good in our society is socialism. I work at a community college. I think it's a socialist institution. You all get passed, you get taxed, low-income students get to go for free, I get a decent salary, and everybody's happy. I think it works out really well. So, uh, so I would say that there's a lot, and then we also have a whole sector of cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives. I live in San Mateo County, and we just, and you guys are in the process of this, we just moved from having private uh, uh, electric system, you know, PG&E, who is providing our electricity, to now in San Mateo County, most people have a community choice um, energy, meaning that we all that there's a public entity that's run by the county where we get our electricity from. And now I get 100% green electricity, um, and it's cheaper than what I got from PG&E. I think that's really cool. So that's an example of what I would call sort of a, a socialist or kind of the the state doing things for good and taking it out of the private sector, much better than PG&E that wanted us to use a lot of electricity and wanted to make as much money out of it as possible and so wasn't making the transition to green energy as fast as, as a state, um, a public entity that would be accountable to the public and could be, could be um, didn't have the profit incentive. Okay, so some of the things to do to get past capitalism then are to valorize and, and notice and recognize all those aspects of our economy that work really well, that we have right now, that are not capitalist. Um, the other thing is that I think another way that capitalism functions and destroys our lives is through consumer culture, you know, and the idea that people have to have humongous houses in order to feel like they're successful as human beings, right? It actually turns out you're not very happy in a big house, you know, that people are sort of distant from one another. So there's all kinds of things like that that people do for status in a capitalist society. They're environmentally wasteful and they're actually really de degrading to our happiness. So, so I think it's important to resist consumer culture um, another aspect of capitalism that I think is really important to fight is sort of uh, what I would say sort of large-scale capitalist processes. So things like the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership, kind of large-scale trade deals that are terrible for local economies and working people and for the environment that give too much power to corporations. Um, those kinds, so, so that part of sort of fighting against capitalism is this kind of little small-scale stuff that you can do locally, but some of it also is looking at what the, um, the the sort of infrastructure of large-scale capitalist processes, people who are fighting for those, how do we fight against those? Um, fighting for democracy in our political system, so fighting against uh, Citizens United and things like that and making sure that we actually have the right people elected so that they don't put in terrible Supreme Court justices to get terrible decisions like, Supreme, like, like Citizens United. Um, Another thing I go into depth in, in the book is what are ways that capitalism creates dependency so that we're dependent upon it. And one of the things, one of the ways, things that ties people into capitalism is if my health care is dependent upon my job, then I'm going to do anything my employer wants to keep that job. But if we have Medicare for all and I don't need that, then I'm able to say, you know what, I actually don't really want that job. I'd actually rather work 20 hours a week and kind of, you know, uh, have a simpler lifestyle. But you can't do that if you need to work 20, 40 hours a week to get health care. So pushing for things like Medicare for all, I think, is incredibly important for um, uh, lessening our dependency on capitalism. Um, I also think it's important to notice that Okay, productivity in the United States has more than doubled in, in the last 40 years. So if you think about that, you know, that, and that means that the rich have gotten incredibly rich. And I don't know if you've ever, if you've looked at, if you look at stats on income inequality in this country right now, it's really extraordinary. It's extraordinary just how much uh, the difference is. And, and, uh, and one little factoid that I found recently, I, I was so astonishing that I went and checked it out and did the math myself, and, and it's true, is that if we had not wealth inequality, which is very unequal in this country, but just simply income equality in this country, every family of four could have $200,000 a year. Right? So just fighting for redistributive policies that made it so that we had income inequality 
income equality or something close to it, we would be doing a lot better. And then if you took those productivity gains, um, so that's one thing is, is, is income equality. The other piece is also about, about the gains from productivity. If we took the gains from productivity and didn't allow them just to go into profits for the 1%, but actually turned that into work time reduction, we could all be working 20 hour weeks um, and have just as much stuff as we have now. So I think, the, and the fight for work time reduction is important because when people People work a lot of hours, they buy a lot of things to, um, to keep themselves happy, right? It's like you're so stressed out, you have to go to Mexico for a vacation, right? As opposed to, you know, just chilling with your friends and having a good time and making things. So you, you end up, it's a vicious cycle when you work too many hours that you have to buy prepared foods, you have to buy kind of quick fix entertainment and things like that. So, and also the sort of gender issue about who's going to take care of our elders and who's going to take care of our children. That if people are working fewer hours, we get to do more of that care-based labor ourselves. Okay, so that's, so that's how you fight capitalism, is all those different things. There are big debates on the left of reform versus revolution, and I, what, and I think it's a sort of a, a useless and not helpful debate, because my belief is that revolutionary reform, what are the thi ways to change to make it so that we have less capitalism and we have more of what leads to a good life? And I don't think you need to overthrow capitalism to get those things, that's kind of the main point of my my book is you need to fight and yes the people with power are going to fight you and we're going to and we're going to push back you know and we're going to push back from where we are okay i want to mention uh, socialism just really briefly um, I myself an anti-capitalist, um, and I think that some access, aspects of what people call socialism are good. So, for example, I think a, a redistributive state, a state that makes it so that it, 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 you know, in the interim, while we still have the very wealthy, that taxes the heck out of them, um, but that also has, you know, things like education and healthcare and things like that. But I actually really agree with some of the critique of. Uh, of authoritarian socialism that says if you have too much of your economy run by, through the state, that that's too much of a concentration of power and it's dangerous. And so I myself believe in, like I said, different, not that having less economy, in other words, having sort of less things go through a market, having people work less, and so those things, so that you don't have uh, an economy where, where the state owns and controls everything. I actually think that that's, that's quite dangerous. Um, but I think you can, you can get rid of capitalism without that. Okay, now I wanna talk, maybe I'll talk to 11.35, okay. Um, I wanna talk about the current political moment because I know after the election of Trump, you know, I'm all, all my like, let's get rid of capitalism and let's do this. And it's like, yeah, let's just survive and not have fascism, how about that? Um, and so uh, sort of how do I put those two things together? Um, and so I wanna say that, um, that for me, of course, that the election was terrifying as, you know, I heard the really lovely introduction of what you folks are about that I bet it was terrifying for most people in this room. And I think that, um, you know, the possibility fascism is still real um, um, and I think it's scary and I also think that um that I spent a lot of time this summer reading about the Koch brothers and have was really I would say terrified terrified by just how much power they have so that even if we get rid of Trump there is right now a very uh, strategically oriented, horizontally and vertically integrated, infinitely well-funded institution that has taken over actually two-thirds of the state houses of this country, has the Republican Party totally captured at this point, and it's actually pretty terrifying. It's actually pretty terrifying, and I think we're not spending enough time thinking about that. I would just urge you to read the book um, Dark Money by Jane Mayer. It's a, it's a really good just, just sort of description of, of kind of how much they control. Just to give one small example, they have, you know, they're, they sponsored ALEC, which I think everybody knows about that did this, uh, sort of lots of, they also sponsored the Tea Party, and they also sponsored um, this uh, set of organizations that exist in every state to sort of come up with policy initiatives, and they were the ones behind uh, what happened in Flint, Michigan with the water system, right? I know, let's, let's privatize the water and let's have it be that it's unregulated. So a huge amount of what's devastating is not just plain old fashioned liberalism or republicanism, it's really coke funded extreme libertarianism and I think it's quite terrifying okay so that's all that um, and I think that you know and one of the things is if you think about the, what that sort of libertarian view is the idea that people with money get to do whatever they want with money and any restriction on that is a restriction on freedom that's I think that's a that's an idea that I actually think has a lot of legs in this valley 
Oh, okay, great. Oh, I thought I was done. I thought the Q&A was done at 2.15. Okay, thank you so much for that. Okay, sorry. So I'll take a few more breaths. Okay. So, um, <laughs> but I do want a big conversation. So I'm going to dig into libertarianism then a little bit more. Because I do think in this valley of all places, it, it really is a, there's a sort of techno-libertarianism that I think is developing that, that's, that's really quite frightening to me. But anyhow, it's basically this idea that, that uh, my freedom to do with my money what I please is the most important freedom and political freedom doesn't matter as much. And I say that too because, again, the, the Koch brothers and sort of all of their sort of entourage, all the people around them, um, they actually, so one of, their, one of their sort of most important intellectuals was this guy James Buchanan who died a few years ago. Um, Buchanan was the founder of what they call, I think it was public choice uh, uh, theory of, of public policy, which is applying the ideas of economics to public policy and supposing that anybody in government is, has to be understood as self-interested. In any case, that whole worldview, um, now I slowed down and I sort of lost my, where am I going? Um, uh, they see that as an infringement of liberty and so what that means then is that any attempt to regulate them is is seen as, as, as an infringement on their freedom. And yet, Buchanan was one of the, the people who worked the hardest to put P Augusto Pinochet in power in Chile in, in 1973. And one of their, and so, you know, horrible, brutal, brutal dictator in power from 73 to 1990. And they had extreme free market economics. And what they did, and, 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 the, um, and Buchanan was one of the, the who's one, again, one of the intellectuals sponsored by the Kochs, what he did was, to, was to put in a constitution in Chile that they're still suffering with to this day that had rules like you know you need super majorities for everything so a small group of people who were, who supported the elite would be able to um, kind of block practically everything. So even I just, there was a, a story recently about uh, abortion rights in Chile where 70% of the population believes that they should have abortion rights, but that 30% that don't have veto power. And so they actually did just pass some limited abortion rights in Chile, but, um, but it's been very difficult. And so these libertarians don't believe them when they say they're about freedom. They're about freedom of people with money to do what they want with their money. They're not about freedom of people to um, set the terms of the society that they live in and decide how they want to live. And so I think it's a very distorted notion of freedom and it's becoming really, I think, predominant in our society. So I would love to dig into that if you want to about that idea of, about that idea of freedom. Now, when, the, when the, the Koch brothers and Buchanan and all these people were putting out all these extreme libertarian ideas, one of their problems was nobody wanted to vote for what they believed in because it was terrible. And when Obama got elected, that started to really change, and it was the, the Tea Party. And I think it's important to see the Tea Party not as a grassroots movement, though there are plenty of grassroots people who are totally like are seriously excited about it all by themselves. But the 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 coke the people call it the octopus the 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 coke octopus put out a huge amount of public policy think pieces and things like that did lots of focus groups about what resonated with people. And when Obama got elected, there was such a sort of a people who were against him, I think for a lot of racist reasons, um, who, who could then get captured. And they paid a huge amount of money for Bill O'Reilly, paid a huge amount of money to, to Fox News. So Bill O'Reilly wasn't just a, a kind of a conservative sexist jerk who was just saying whatever he wanted to say. He was all those things and was being paid a huge amount of monies and actually paid money to say those things. So that, that, again, what we're up against is billions of dollars being spent to kind of get people to believe in a certain way of understanding the world, which is very, very dangerous. Okay, that I think is what's happening with the Republican Party. Um, I don't think that they, um, oh, and then one of the things I wanted to say too is that part of that whole way of thinking about the world, I don't know if you remember, but when Mitt Romney was running for president, that one of the things he got sort of he got caught saying to a funders meeting was that that he was in, he was against this 40% 47% of the country who are takers and part of that libertarian ideology is that people with money are makers and they do things and they make things happen and all the rest of us are takers and i remember when i heard that thinking that's awfully strange and that's an awfully you know usually it's just oh that small number of sort of pretend welfare cheats that are people of color that's you know who who people get all excited about for that but 
when he said 47%, it turns out that that actually is, that is part of that worldview. And they don't say that to the public. They don't say that to their everyday Tea Party supporter types. But that is actually part of that, that extreme libertarian worldview, is this idea that the people with money are the ones who make things, and the rest of us, like the laborers who actually make things and educate kids and build roads and da-da-da, like we're all takers. And I actually, had, somebody said that to me. I live in Pacific and I'm involved in a lot of political struggles and I, I'm one of the right-wing blogs in town. Somebody said that I was on the pu I, I was on the public dole. Like, don't listen to her. She's on the public dole. And I was like, wow, I'm a teacher. Like, really? So that's, that's sort of an extreme version of being on the take. Okay, so that's, I think, who captured the country. Now I think, and, and I call that group nativist capitalists. And the idea there of the, the, the sort of what's happening with the Republican Party is it's the capitalist class wanting to get rich and wanting to sort of, you know, continue to profit using all the power they can to kind of continue to profit and using these sort of veiled and sometimes not veiled racist appeals to get people to vote for something which is clearly not in the interest of most people in this country. That I would counterpose to what I call cosmopolitan capitalism. Um, and that's how I think of the Democratic Party right now, which is still pro-capitalist, still doing, you know, doing the bidding of Wall Street, not as invested in the fossil fuel people, right? I think that's a really important distinction between the Republicans and the Democrats at this point, is the Republicans have been totally captured by the fossil fuel industry. The Democrats, on the other hand, are much more general miscellaneous capitalism and also a lot of, a lot of support for Wall Street. Um, and whereas the Republicans get people to vote for something not in their interest, and that's in the interest of the 1% by kind of uh, getting their sort of resentments and racism and, and hatred of, of other people and all that going. The Democrats do it on something which I consider much better, which is, I would say, that's sort of a kind of a multiculturalism. And so the idea of that people will vote for, for Democrats because Democrats do, in fact, to keep, our, uh, to keep us voting for them, you know, they, they usually work hard for civil rights, they work hard for things for the environment, they work for a social safety net. I think those are all really good and really, really important things. Things. And so you see in any sort of given democratic um, politician a kind of a push and a pull, right? Some of them are 100% for the kind of the, the, the public goods kinds of things. And yeah, they have to do some fundraising, but they're really doing a good job. Some of them are all about what's, what's, you know, what's, uh, what their funders want of them. And they do just a little bit of that as kind of you know, whitewashing or whatever. I, so I think the Democratic Party is really a, a contested space around that. And I think, though, that one of the things that happened with the most recent presidential election was that Hillary Clinton mostly ran on be afraid of them, they're terrible and they're racist, and didn't do anything to really, or didn't do much, didn't do enough to motivate people to vote based on the kind of the grassroots needs. And I think if you look at the, the I was really interested after the election in the numbers, that it was not the case that a whole bunch of extra white racists came out to vote. The same number of white racists voted for, for um, Trump as voted for, as voted for Romney. But what you saw actually was a real falling off of voting among those sort of marginalized folks who tend to feel disaffected from and disconnected from the system and weren't sort of motivated to vote for her. And so you saw um, actually fewer people of color voting, fewer young people voting, um, fewer low-income people voting. And I think that that really actually matters a lot. Um, and so I think that it's really important for us, in, you know, if you want to sort of that fighting capitalism involves all those things that I said earlier, and I think in terms of the electoral system, it really it really involves uh, taking back our local political systems. I think those fights within the Democratic Party that are happening right now are really important. There are alternative parties that that, that may or may not uh, become something important in the, in the uh, future period. And I know that's a super contentious issue, and I'm happy to dig into that in the Q&A. But that's... Um, yeah, so I, I went kind of fast, but I, I really do love questions and answers and conversations, so that's, that's where I'm going to stop. Yes, why don't you start while he, yeah. Do you want to get the mic? We have to. You have to, okay. Yeah. Um, actually, since I have the mic, I'll oh. just ask first. <laughs> Power <laughs> move. <laughs> What, what would be a Marxist analysis of Islamo-fascism, in your opinion? Have you ever thought about that? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I don't use the word Islamo-fascism. I, I don't even know exactly what baggage that brings. But what I would say is that the... Um, 
you know, I think that if you look at the Middle East, that so many of those countries have had no, they've been devastated by transnational capital. They've had dictatorships, just to take Egypt as just one example, right? Egypt had a horrible dictator, Mubarak, who was kept in power largely by the United States and the sort of transnational pro-capitalist forces in order to make that place a place that you could extract capital from. And people hated it, and leftists, people who had sort of like a, let's do this all together and let's share kind of a vision, we're all murdered. So when you've got that and you've got no possibility and there's also sort of humiliation against your culture that comes with, see, we in the West, we're the smart ones, we're the ones who have it all figured out, you people are so backward. You put that all together and I think people were driven to having really no sense of future and no choice except, you know, the sort of like the promises. So I think the sort of promises of, of Islamic fundamentalism, you know, of, uh, are very similar actually to... I think people's relationship to that is similar to Trump voters, right? People who feel shat on by the society and they're looking for a way to feel good about themselves and somebody comes along and says, here's how you feel good about yourself um, and here's how we're going to be great, you know, make, right? make us great again. So, so that's my understanding of what's happened. And so many of those countries um, that uh, have had uh, kind of what I would consider sort of right-wing fundamentalist movements have been places that have been devastated by transnational capital, have had dictatorships kept in power by the transnational forces, and have had their the sort of all, the what I would think of as sort of the happy alternatives of sort of social democracy, anti-capitalism, any of those kinds of things, completely foreclosed uh, for them largely by U.S. policy. She had her hand up first. Right. <clears throat> Well, first of all, welcome. We're very glad to hear uh, your opinions, Ms. Kaufman. I was so interested in what you had to say that I actually did a little research ahead of your lecture. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure you must be familiar with a man by the name of Arthur C. Brooks. No. Oh, yeah, he's with the American Enterprise Institute. Oh, okay. He, he's written several, he's written a book or two, and he's also written several articles that I've been able to read. And one that really struck me in the process of my research was something called Making a Moral Case for Capitalism. Uh -huh. He uh, he makes the point that our founding fathers, for example, Thomas Jefferson, was they were motivated by by moral principles, and mm -hmm. their defense of America was in its morality, and mm -hmm. they were staunch capitalists. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooks says the the freedom our founders fought for is expressed in the form of free enterprise the system of laws and institutions that rewards entrepreneurship and hard work, largely on the basis of markets and competition. Yeah. So he, he paints us a, a vision of capitalism which is perhaps different from yours. Yes. And it's one that I've heard all my life, yep. and forgive me for clinging to it. He makes yeah, yeah, the point yeah. that we have three arguments to make. First, we have to argue for the right of every American to earn his or her success. And he points out that the, the uh, law, the, uh, I guess, liberal system that we have today tends to discourage individuals from really earning their keep. That's, those are my words. And he uh -huh. says, too, for earned success, we need a system that matches our skills and passions, rewards, and hard work, and lets us keep those rewards. Second, we have to argue for basic fairness, which he argues uh, is not found in the communist system and uh, in the system espoused by Marx, uh -huh. whom you've quoted. Uh, third, we have to argue for the rights of the poor and fight for the system that lifts them up by the billions. And this is something that he said that I thought was really remarkable. Between 1970 and 2010, the percentage of the world's population living on less than a dollar a day mm -hmm. has been reduced by about 80%. Yeah. What explains this miracle, he asks? The United Nations or International Monetary Fund? No. U.S. foreign aid? No, of course not. It was globalization, the free trade system, entrepreneurship, property rights, and the rule of law spreading around the world. So what is the system that satisfies our demand to let people earn their success that is fair 
that lifts the poor by the millions. There's only one, says Brooks, free enterprise. Yeah, okay, so that's a lot, and I'm happy to kind of give you a lot back. So, so one thing, just to say that, that uh, so American Enterprise Institute is another one of those, those Coke and the other billionaires funded things. And that doesn't, that doesn't destroy your argument at all, but I just want to say that. No, 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 not at all. But I, but I think it's important to realize that. I mean, even, you know, I don't know if you remember, but like t 15 years ago, there was a big splash, a book by a guy named Charles Murray that basically said that it was sort of making some of this argument that made the case that, um, that welfare and things like that were actually sort of destroyed people's sense of self and that they were psychologically harmful. And again, he was somebody who was not an academic who made it in the academic world. He was completely and 100% funded by and his book promoted through those think tanks. So that's sort of not like the free exchange of ideas. Oh, all that's just a bunch of stuff. But in terms of the actual ideas that you said, because they're important ideas, I think that, um, I don't know, the, the earning your ability to make your keep, to, to, for your keep. I guess I want a society where people who are disabled, who aren't able to, to work for themselves, have some way to live. I want a, a society where everybody, where people don't have to work three, so you, because if you, take, if you take his idea to the sort of, you know, he also doesn't believe in a minimum wage, for example. So if, it, you know, so if you just say, like, everybody gets to compete and sort of work as they please, well, guess what? People are going to be working, like, you know, in, in Dickens' time, right? In other words, that's, I don't see how it's not that, because it's, it's a regulatory state that has allowed for there to be things like a minimum wage that make it so that, that, that people have, um, aren't just worked to death. So I think in a society, so that's what I would say is that I don't believe that. Your second one about fairness, um, I didn't hear as much in that about um, why, yeah, I mean, I don't think that an authoritarian social state is fair either. Now, the, and part of the, the libertarian move that he's making is, again, this idea of defining freedom as freedom to do what you want with your resources and money, right? And I just think that, we were all born into this world, like some of us were born into it with a lot and some of it were born into it with nothing. And so just to take the Koch brothers as an example, or Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump was born into a billion dollars and then he worked hard and made it into more billions or maybe less, we don't know because we haven't seen his taxes. But in any case, I mean, that could all just be bravado. But in any case, you know, somebody who was born with absolutely nothing and has nothing in their life but their ability to sell their labor, I want to make it so that that's going to lead to a good life. I, I want to have it be that, that there's regulations and things like that that make it such that that person's not going to be devastated. Third, your thing about the, the end of poverty, I think it's really interesting. And it's, and it's true. And actually, I, I read the British Guardian newspaper, and they often have a lot of positive things about changes happening in the world. And it really is true that huge numbers of people have come out of extreme poverty in the last 40 years. But how you can attribute that to free market capitalism, I don't know. Most of them were in communist China, OK? Um, a huge numbers of them are in states that have strong social safety nets. And so to say that it was global capital, you know, global capital led to uh, uh, total devastation. I, I've, I'm writing another book called Challenging Power, and, and one of the cases that I look at really carefully in that book is the collapse of the Rana Plaza um, factory in Bangladesh in 2013, in which about 3,000 people died. It was a it was a global sweatshop that you know manufactured clothing for people uh, for all kinds of different corporations. The you know unregulated capitalism, global globalization meant that. The people, the, the people who are running those factories were, were pushed to do things for the absolute lowest cost possible to give those people jobs. Well, those people had jobs. You know, their land was stolen to put uh, the factories in the places where they're making that. So there's all kinds of cases where people are living just fine, thank you very much, until global capital comes and takes their, their land away. So I think that it's true what you're saying, that many people, that there's been a real move in the last 50 years out of people globally out of extreme poverty.
poverty. But if you want to say what caused that, I think there's a lot of causes, and global, is, global capital I don't think is one of them. I remember that I'm quoting Arthur Brooks here. Yeah. Uh, I have to say that personally, I believe with many of the things that you and I uh, would agree with, I'm, I'm sort of a, uh, one Double of those effect. strange hybrid people that uh -huh. feels that the state should be strong in order to regulate and, and eliminate abuses such as the kind of, right. of uh, abusive capitalism that you're talking about. Uh -huh. uh, I think that there are other, other better examples of capitalists than Donald Trump or the Koch brothers. You can go to your local car dealership or to the baker whose a, a shop feeds several people, yeah. several hundred people in New York. I mean, America was built on small enterprise. And I feel that if we are going to abuse capitalism this way, we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, yeah, and what I would say to that is that, that I, like when I imagine sort of a transition from where we are to a world with less and less and less to the point that there's no capitalism, I think small business is great. I mean, I really do. And, or can be. I mean, let me actually, can I just give you a sort of a weird tangent example that um, a lot of my students, so you know, I run this democracy institute, so I train students to be community organizers and, and give them internships and, and help them work on projects. So one of them is that they were working on bus rapid transit. The idea that this area is very poorly designed and it's really designed terribly for climate, right? It's, in other words, it's designed very much for everybody to have a big house and everybody to have a car and that sort of thing. So my students were working with VTA and with a local organizer to try to get bus rapid transit. So a system where the buses would have preference and you'd have lots of buses and it would be the, the buses go faster than the cars, which happens in many different places in cities and other countries. Um, you know, you would would, um, you, it would be great for the climate. So VTA was working really hard on that, and it got killed by the car dealerships in Sunnyvale. In other words, the, and the car dealerships had enough uh, power over the local city council. They now have a progressive city council in Sunnyvale, but at the t and now it's too late for bus tra rapid transit. VTA has given up, which I think is tragic. In any case, it was like VTA was really into it until that. And so what I would say is like, yeah, small business is great, but also look at the, the political power that businesses have, and it can be quite dangerous. Okay. Arthur Jackson here. Uh, to, to my mind, at the core oh, of this whole thing is is what we think corporations are, uh -huh. and what what Thomas Jefferson thought about corporations, which he didn't think anything about corporations because corporations was not an idea that existed when yeah. the United States of America came into being. Right. And as a result, corp, uh, our corporations were established in 1811 in the state of New York to to do what. They've done, and that idea travel around the world. Yes. The whole, and to my mind, from a humanist perspective, benefit corporations would be the model because a benefit corporations functions for the good of the of everybody involved, not just yes. the people with the money who start up the company, but for all the people who run it, make it work, use it, suffer from what it does wrong, and so to take. And unfortunately, benefit corporations are, are rarely talked about in, yeah. the, in the world, and yet to me, they're the answer to, to how in the hell you're going to build a world because corporations are an essential part of doing things, whether they're run by the government as, as China and, and the, at any rate. <laughs> so don't throw corp benefit corporations out of the conversation. Okay. And let me just a couple more words about that. I just want to amplify that and for people who don't know much about that. You know, typical corporations in this country, your articles of incorporation say that your... Um, uh, what is it like? It's like you're entrusted with other people's money to make the most profit possible. So if you do other things and you say, actually, we'd rather make less money and do something better for the workers or better for the environment, you're actually violating your corporate charter. So something is emerging, which is like B corporations or benefit corporations. And in California, that's now allowed. So, you know, Clover Dairy, which I think is really wonderful, you know, so Northern California Dairy has become a benefit corporation. And I think of that as something really positive and as a kind of a positive transition. The idea idea that, um, because I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, and f what I do want to do is call out what the serious real problems are, and then to work against those and work for the things that we think are better. And I think benefit corporations is a really good example of kind of a, of a, of a positive transitional thing. We've got a question way in the back, and you seem so urgent that I want to call on you. Uh, thank you for noticing me. Um, <laughs> 
So the thing is, where you started out by uh, critic, uh, uh, giving the definition of Marxism, uh -huh. and I feel that the, I've lived in America for 30 years, and America right now is all about corporations, the way I've experienced it, and I don't see it different than we may call the America as capitalist, but I feel yeah. it's a communist because everything is oh. but distributed co communism because it's distributed corporations and they have the lobby. Right. And so you're thinking that uh, the consumerism is a capitalism. I disagree. Consumerism is when there's affluence. So no oh. matter what, when there's affluence, there will be, you know, you, you're talking about giving 200K. You give 200K to the people, it will just increase consumerism. Because you cannot tell people what to spend and not to spend for. Yeah. So that I think we, when we when we use labels, we get confused. I mean, we mm -hmm. don't make the difference. And givers and takers, you're talking about, and I think it also comes. It's a culture of the people who want to work for the large corporations. America is a free country, and Jefferson never said that you know you have to have large corporations. But American as a culture choose to work for corporations. Americans as a culture do not like public transportation. So, you know, you, you, you can blame the Sunnyvale dealers and all of that, but you go out and talk to 10 Americans. Yes. They would not take, they want the freedom of the car. Yeah, but I think... So, you know, so that's what... The, the yeah, but you know, Okay, mm -hmm. I just want to make a point is that when we come up with all these labels and we blame the system, we, we take away the responsibility of the people. So this talk will be more effective when we also incorporate what people can do, because right. we are still a free country. Trump or no Trump. Yeah, and, and I think that whole idea of looking at social outcomes as the aggregation of individual choices is actually part of the problem. I really do. Because let me just give you an example. I live in Pacifica, and I work in Cupertino at De Anza, and I would love to take public transportation, but it would take me three hours to get to work. So I'm actually not choosing to be in traffic right now. I've been at my job for you know 25 years, and in the beginning, there was no traffic, and it was great. Now there's traffic. So most Americans actually don't want to be in traffic. Most Americans don't want to destroy the climate. But you're presented with, with a sort of a basket of choices. And I think it's important to, uh, there's about 10 different things I want to say. OK, so otherwise it's always a mess. Um, so I think that it's important to always look at the context in which a choice is made. And I do think that, um, that, it's, that you're right that huge in our culture is, I think we have a very capitalist dominated culture. I mean, I see that with my kid, I have a 15 year old and she is totally brand loyal to Apple. I'm like super anti-Apple, right? I'm just like, there's a lot of things I don't like about Apple. Um, but in any, you know, but I understand for a kid, like they're shiny projects and they products and they're fun to use and all of that. But in any case, it's like, I've tried to rate, you know, but she, you know, grew up in a society where that's the cool thing to have and you got to have the new phone or you're a loser and all that. So I think that, there, that there's a bunch of stuff about status that's really, really important. And I think that's, that's really crucial because I think that it's quite w well within reach to solve the climate crisis, but we're not going to solve the climate crisis if everybody drives cars everywhere and lives in huge houses and things like that. So we've got to, we've got to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels and we've got to wean ourselves off of kind of buying things that break and then you buy another thing next year and that one breaks and you buy another one. All of that I think is terrible for the environment and not good for us and doesn't lead to happiness. One last thought. There's a whole bunch of uh, a literature developing in the social sciences on the notion of happiness. And what they found is that people's happiness is very related to, inversely related to the level of stratification in their society. So the average level of happiness in the United States is actually lower than the average level of happiness in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a country where people don't have all that much, but the level of inequality is much less. So people's happiness yeah. is really related to when you have a strong community, when you have a strong social safety net, when you feel like people care about you, those are the things that actually lead toward, and you're not afraid for your future and your children's future, those are the things that lead to happiness. And so I agree with you that um, I would say that Americans are sort of addicted to cum consumer culture and that it's really dangerous and terrible and that part of my like little speech is to like get off of that bandwagon. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know, I have, I have problems with uh, talking in terms of extremes. Uh -huh. You know, I heard, um, what was it, rightist or extreme libertarians. I, I didn't s hear the same phraseology about socialists, uh, but that's just a side 
side thing. I've I done a little re i have done a little research also. I was looking at, and um, you know, I'm glad you've been involved since the 80s. Uh, welcome aboard. I've been involved since the 60s. Okay. Um, I was looking I was, at your Vita project. Can young. I finish? Yeah. I was looking at your Vita projects. I agree with almost all of them. They're terrific. Housing rights, transportation, creative art, education, etc. Um, but on the concentration of power, uh -huh. what are your thoughts? Um, well, where I'm coming from, I think we need a trust buster like Teddy Roosevelt yeah. to go after Google, mm -hmm. Facebook, yes. all these big conglomerates of power. And yes. I don't see anybody talking about that, which I think is terrible. Yeah. And on your course, critical, critical consciousness and social change, uh -huh. uh, you talk about referencing classical and current works. Okay. Um, I assume that part of that I'm sure you've read this, right? Uh, the theory of moral sentiments. Is that part of that? Uh, I don't teach that book, but I think it's interesting. I mean, when I taught more general philosophy, I was interested in Hume. That, that's a classic um, yeah. analysis of what capitalism can be. Uh -huh. You know, not the wealth of nations nonsense that Rand and other people misguidedly followed, yeah. but that's the basic concept. You know, unbridled mm -hmm. capitalism, unbridled socialism, both are terrible. Right. Yeah, no, and I think I said that. I mean, I think I said that. And, and just, to, just to sort of defend myself a little bit on the, the extreme libertarianism, it's because I, I think, I mean, I've known lots of people who are libertarians who are not extremists, right, that, they're, that they have a sort of reasonable point of view. But I think it's terrifying that our state has now been captured by extreme libertarians. I think it's terrifying. And what I mean is the ideology of the Kochs and people who are completely beholden to them. I think it's terrifying. And if you know, and I don't think that the problem of sort of ex extreme authoritarian communism is a problem right now. I just don't. Um, and, and, and yet I do really agree with the fundamental point that you made that, that I, I, I am most interested in what diffuses power and what challenges power. And I think that having a, uh, an authoritarian socialist state that runs the economy is a concentration of power, which is quite dangerous. So I think I really agree with you. Um, Jerry Grass, uh, about corporations in the history. Um, in 2010, I did a talk on Citizens United, and in preparation for that, I read a book by Thomas Hartman, where he says at the time of the revolution, uh, uh, the colonists in general were very unhappy with corporations because they blamed their problems yeah. with England on East India Company. Yeah, so true. in fact, in the early days of the United States, if you wanted to create a corporation, you had to have it pass through the both state houses. It had to be in the public good. It had to be a limited time. It misbehaved. The charter could be revoked and all that. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that things have changed so much since then is because the corporations have always had enough excess money to spend on the lawyers and spend yeah. on public relations to change their image and uh, yeah. and they've just gradually gotten more and more powerful the whole time except for certain times during like populism and the depression. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with that and that you can imagine, you know, you're talking about trust busting. I think that Elizabeth Warren might be, you know, she might be our trust buster coming along. I hope so. But yeah, no, a absolutely. And you think about if you, even A corporations, it's like they are supposed to operate, you know, to some extent in the public good. By the way, a really good uh, film on this is called The Corporation that sort of talks about the sort of psychopathic nature of, of uh, and it uses that. It's like if you look at all of the um, characteristics of, of, you know, psychological psychopathy, like not caring about the the impacts of your actions, not caring about other people, it, the sort of the way the modern corporation functions kind of fits all those definitions. Yeah. Who else? Hi. I think one of the best examples of the importance of government regulation, if you look at the regulations about safety in cars in the uh -huh. 1950s and yeah. 60s, no airbags, no seat belts. Right. Uh, and the thing that I found out was most egregious is there was no requirement for dual braking systems. Huh. In the 50s and 60s, there was one hydraulic system. If you had a leak in that system, you had zero brakes. Uh -huh. And people died because yeah. of that. Uh, I had that happen to one of my cars, and it was a near fatal accident. I went and looked at how it could be retrofitted to a dual braking system. 
cost $30. Yeah. And now all cars are required to have that. Um, yeah. But $30 was more than manufacturers were willing to spend in the 50s and 60s because of the competition to keep the cost as low as possible. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned very quickly the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I thought you were negative about it. Could yeah. you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, because, you know, uh, I think, you know, trade is fine, global trade is fine. It's the question of the conditions under which it operates. And actually, one of the things that that, um, that I think is helpful, there's a great book that just came out called Donut Economics, the idea, like, we need to have uh, people above the level of poverty but below the level at which they're just destroying the environment. That forms a donut. And you have a different way of thinking of economics. And one of the arguments she makes in that book that I really like is that there's no such thing as an unregulated yeah. market, right? Markets are things that people create to do things that they want and they always have rules and those rules are always contested politically. And so I don't think that, that global trade is a bad thing at all. The question is what are the conditions under which you have global trade? And one of the terrible things about the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that it would have, or would in the countries that have it if, if it goes forward without us, is that it allowed a sort of a small group of um, uh, people that were mostly dominated by, by for-profit corporations to adjudicate claims. So if the United States says, we don't want to have tuna that's caught in ways that you know kill dolphins, then you could call that an unfair trading practice. And that's actually one of the things that happened under the WTO was it was a fight between the US and Mexico over that. I want that to come out on the side of the dolphins. I don't want that to come out on the side of the of the um, of the corporations that are pushing for the tuna fishing. And so that's the kind of thing that the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership had a dispute mechanism. I mean, there's a lot of things people didn't like, but that was the core one that seemed the most important to me, was a dispute resolution mechanism that was completely dominated by corporations. Yeah. Um, there's just so many things to say, but um, I agree with this gentleman back here that it's not a zero-sum game, and, and I don't think you're, you're truly an anti-capitalist. I think a better term might be there are something to do with there are problems with capitalism that need to be fixed because there are an equal number of problems with socialism. Just as an example, a friend of mine, a photographer from China, he swam uh, to Tokyo, well, not to Tokyo, to Hong Kong to escape Red China. And I spent three weeks a few years ago in China with him, and he said, it's just changed so much. Yeah. He said it used to be when it was communist, which is a step above socialism, but it's run in a socialistic way, he would go into a restaurant and the employers, the, the uh, waiters, were offended and were put out because he came in and disturbed their free time. Because they, were, they had guaranteed employment, mm -hmm. they all received the same wage, there were no tips, so there was no incentive for them right. to, uh, to provide good food and so forth. And when I was in China, the reason why they are bringing themselves out of poverty is not because of socialism, but because of capitalism. Mm -hmm. They did not start to bring themselves out of poverty until they started to ease up on their socialistic requirements. When I walked down one street in a small town, almost everybody had their garage open, not a garage, but they had an open area where they were selling cho uh, shoes and trinkets and household items, and it was very capitalistic. Mm -hmm. And even their transit system. I rode on a bus and I asked my friend, I said, why is, it seems like it's a man and wife. And he said, yes, he said, it's, it's their bus. Mm -hmm. They have to follow the regulations of the city and the time schedules. But if their bus fails, they go out of business and somebody else will take it over. And so it was to their best interest to provide good service to be on time. Right. And, and so it's, it's not an either or system. Sweden, right. which is one of the most, quote, socialistic systems in the world, has a lower corporate tax rate than we do, 22 percent. Mm -hmm. They are, uh, the Economist magazine say that it's one of the best countries for investing. Their stock market is skyrocketing. 
and they are very capitalistic. They're friendly to capitalism. So you yeah, can't, and so no, and you actually, gotta be careful. Well, I'm trying to be careful, um, and you know, and one of the things I think, you know, my discipline is philosophy, and I really like playing with concepts, and right, and so I. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that capitalism should be replaced with socialism. That's actually really, really not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's a bunch of things that come from capitalism that are dangerous and problematic that we need to analyze and we need to get rid of them. And so, and, um, and I said really clearly that I don't believe in, in state socialism as a way of running an economy at all. Um, I think it's really helpful to think of these, to think of societies in terms of as, as hybrids, right? And like I was saying about the United States, we do not have a capitalist economy. We have a large capitalist sector. We have a small business sector. We have a multinational controlled sector. We have a corporate controlled sector. We have a huge amount of household labor, which goes un unthought about by most economists. We have worker-owned cooperatives. We have, you know, government, you know, socialism, meaning sort of you know, things controlled by the state, we have all of those things. And I think the question of, is which ones work best for which kinds of things? And, and, and then the question of incentives I do think is important. I've, I've had a lot of friends who've worked in worker-owned cooperatives. They work really great, you know? And they're small businesses, right? So just, uh, uh, you know, I'm on the, on the board of Human Agenda, and Human Agenda, and they're a South Bay organization, and they're working on trying to get some worker-owned cooperatives going here. There's a pizza place that's like, I forget what it's like. It, it, anyhow, that's, that's, that's starting to, to move towards being a worker-owned cooperative. So, when you're in a worker-owned cooperative, you still have to do well. You still have to make pizza that people like. Aris Mendy, by the way, is a, is a network of cooperatives in, in the North Bay. So there's a couple, one in Emeryville, one in Oakland, a couple in San Francisco that are, and I think they're wonderful. You know, they have to make good pizza for people to come there and buy their stuff. But also, the workers get to decide what they're going to do with their profits. They get to decide, should we close on Labor Day or not? They get to decide those things. And if they do well and make profits, they get to keep that for themselves. So, so I think the question, and look at, you know, I am a state worker, right? I work really hard. Most people I know who teach work really hard. That's not capitalism that's making Amen. us serve our students well. There are other incentive structures. So I think it's important to think about what are all the incentives that need to happen and what, how to get the incentives right so that good things happen. I think entrepreneurship thing is great. I think a society that has, you know, that, that has ways of encouraging people. But let me give you an example of that too. People always think of capitalism as what makes it so we have all the great inventions. Most of our great medical things we have in this country came from state-sponsored research. The internet was started by the military. And yet now these private corporations are sort of reaping the profits of what was really kind of a social, a social thing. So lots of great inventions happen when you, you pay smart people to be in a room together and say, figure it out and come up with something great. And they're scientists and they care and they want to invent things. They don't need to get rich off of it to do that. So incentives are complicated. Yeah. Uh, Dana St. George. Hi, I have a question about uh, controlling uh, about international global trade. Okay. A um, long time ago, when we lived in Geneva, Switzerland, we I worked at the GATT, G A T T, mm -hmm. and I was just like an office worker. But it appeared to me there was this huge global network of trade regulations. Right. And my question is kind of, what happened? It seemed to be working then, uh -huh. and how did it kind of get out of control or whatever um, yeah. and so that corporations could actually sue governments if right. they didn't like their rules and yeah. I don't understand how so, is yeah. it an outgrowth of GATT or was GATT gotten rid of and replaced with another structure or what happened? Well, GATT was su su succeeded by the WTO, the World Trade Organization. So I don't know this history well, but my sense is right that that if you had sort of neutral organizations that kind of set some rules and things like that, and that you could have global trade and it would be fine. My understanding of what happened in the 1980s was that the, um, that the transnational corporations became too powerful in comparison with those regulatory agencies. 
And so the, then GATT was then re sort of replaced in a way. I mean, it still exists in some ways, but it was largely superseded by the World Trade Organization, which had horrific kinds of, of rules, like, like what I was describing with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, where, the, where, again, as you said, sort of corporations were encouraged. I think I'm losing my mic. Maybe I'm moving my head too much. I don't know. Anyhow, um, where corporations were allowed to sue governments for regulations and things like that. So I just think that what happened was the corporations became too powerful. Yeah. I think I have the mic. Can you yes. guys hear me? I think it's a wonderful conversation. I, I do think there's um, terminology, I think, is can get mixed up. It's a very mm -hmm. complicated topic. Yes. So for example, I don't know, I just want to recommend a book, if you haven't read it, Saving Capitalism, written by uh, Krugman. Okay, he's uh -huh. a professor. He used yeah. to be the Treasury Secretary, I think. Yep. So I kind of subscribe to that view that says, I think we're all having that debate, you know, market-based yeah. economies, okay, definitely work. As this gentleman said, mm -hmm. socialism, I came from India where we had socialism, extreme socialism. The GDP was growing at 1% a year for like 40 years after independence. Mm -hmm. So as in China, market-based economies do work better, perform better. So I think what we're talking about is how do we get the rules fixed? Because capitalism is about a set of rules right. that everybody plays by businesses, individuals, taxation is part of that. Global trade is part of that. So I think um, I would subscribe to the view that we, we need to take control. We, have, we live in a democracy, right. so we shouldn't let the corporations become too powerful. Right. We shouldn't let the Koch brothers dictate lobbyism and uh, funding uh, campaigns, for example. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a very complicated topic. But I do think that in like Germany, for example, it, it's, it's a capitalistic society, but half of the board members are from the union. Unions are stronger. So unions, I think, are a good thing. Yeah. Uh, if you look at our history in this country, after World War II, unions really helped get a very solid middle class going. Uh, unions yeah. are more powerful. And unions have been terribly weakened. So, so it, it's a complicated topic. But then unions get too powerful also. So the extreme side, that you got to keep in mind. So it's, it's, it's like a knife's edge. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's very complicated, but I think it's a wonderful discussion. Yeah. Uh, I, it was just some comments. I yeah, yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's interesting what you're saying. And, and I, I feel like, you know, given how far out of whack we are in this society, I think you and I would probably agree with about 90% of things, right? You know, and I also I, I had misquoted who wrote the theory of moral sentiments. That's Adam Smith. And, and, you know, even Adam Smith himself in the theory of moral sentiments says that if you just let the butcher and the baker and everybody trade with each other, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to terrible social consequences. And I think it's important to realize that, that Adam Smith himself knew that you needed to have regulation. So I think, so uh, what I would say is that, you know, probably most of us in this room agree on probably 80% of the whole thing. And then there's that smaller piece. And I think one of the reasons why I want to make the sort of more maximal claim is, is, ha is and so most struggles we would be on the same side and doing the same thing. Um, some of it has to do with the ideas of freedom that are that are based in that sort of the, the sort of like in the DNA of our culture is this idea of you know freedom as freedom to do what I want with my property and and it's really dangerous and the ways also that when when that because that's such a big part of our culture it's very hard for us to regulate capitalism in this country and then going back to India you know I don't know that example as well as I wish I did. But I know an awful lot of Indians who think that the social, social safety net has been shredded and that the move from a kind of a highly regulated, very sort of sclerotic, you know, kind of like, kind of stuck kind of a socialism to a sort of a more free market, that a lot of people have been left behind by that. And also that you have land grabs and indigenous people who are sort of losing their access to land. So I don't think in India even you can say that you sort of move from a kind of a terrible socialism to a, like a kind of a functioning capitalism that's pulling people out of poverty. I think that, that, um, that there's problems there too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess just to reiterate what Amar said, I, I think, yeah, a lot of the discussion here and debate is on the, the semantics of capitalism. Mm -hmm. I think people understand it differently and to take an anti-capitalist stance will get a lot of people who support your ideas fighting you just because they have a different definition of capitalism, which is a great shame. But um, but that aside, my, my comment was, looking historically, you mentioned the income inequality as being a huge issue, right. which I agree. If you look historically, it was almost identical in like 1910, 1920, before Correct. the collapse, right? right? And we went from there 
to the 50s and 60s with 90% tax rate and a much more equitable society, right? Yeah. So my question is, and I haven't studied that period of history, are there lessons to be learned there? I mean, we did have a world war, which probably made a big difference, which you don't particularly want again, but are there actual changes that were progressive right. that were made that we can learn from and repeat? There hasn't been a lot, apart from arguments over the semantics, yeah. you know, what can we do to make that change again and to bring back a more progressive, balanced society, less consumerist and yeah. where money is not free speech, et cetera, et cetera? What do we do? Yeah. So if you look at Robert Reich's movie on inequality, he shows this picture that looks like the Bay Bridge, right? So it's like, you know, you had ex uh, extreme inequality. Oh, wait, so anyhow. The, anyhow, you, so you're right about that. And um, I think what happened to get rid of that extreme inequality that we had in this country in the 1920s was the Depression and the New Deal. So what happened was you had tremendously powerful social movements, um, basically the country falling apart and kind of, you know, and the possibility actually of socialism. You know, the Socialist Party was very strong. The unions were very strong. Poor people's movements were strong. There was a huge level of social disruption. And Roosevelt kind of, you know, the New Deal was, okay, what people call the capital labor accord. Like, we'll allow the unions to be strong. We're going to have a social safety net. We're going to have social security and things like that. And... Um, and labor is going to, and capital is going to give the working class more, and the working class is going to be less less frightened for their futures, and um, and then they're not going to kind of have a revolution, and and that really worked. It worked for a long time. It was very very effective, um, and so and I just want to say too that. You know, there are lots of people like Krugman who are making the case for which you guys want to, to say, and I think it's great. I think it's really important. I myself define myself as an anti-capitalist because I think that what a lot of those people don't go for is really understanding the power relationships. In other words, it's not about just sitting back and talking about this. Working class people get what they need, and we get the regulation when we fight for it. And I think that, that there's a sort of a liberal idea that says, Let's just be smart and let's ask for what's right and that's what's going to happen. And what I want to say is given the nature of capitalism, given the nature of people's using their money to control the state, we're not going to get what we want unless we fight for it. And that doesn't mean a, 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 re a revolution to overthrow the state, but it does mean strong, powerful grassroots movements that, that challenge power. And, and, and one of the reasons I wrote my book, too, was because I come from that world of, of people who are more on the left and socialists, who I felt like were totally stuck in their analysis. Capitalism sucks, but we need to wait for the revolution. And, and, and so I was mostly actually writing for people sort of within my little subgroup, in a way, if that makes sense. Well, thank you for your talk. Q&A is over. Let's right. give her a big hand.